Hey, New Heights family, I miss you so much this morning, but thank you so much for joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Let me tell you, we have a wonderful word about Jesus Christ this morning and a great word about finding hope in a pandemic such as this. So if you will, join us in worship this morning.
adore you for who you are. We are here to praise your great name from on high. And during this season of Advent, God, let our whole mind's attention and our heart's affection be put on the sacrifice that you gave us. The sacrifice that you gave us. God, we are so thankful that you found us worthy enough when we had no worth to come and be the perfect sacrifice we are forever grateful. God, let this season not be a season of gloom as it gets dark and as it gets cold. But let this season, as we reflect on the sun, be a time of great joy and celebration. God, during this uncertain time of COVID, give us peace. A wonderful counselor be with us in all these days. And mighty God, we put our whole hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, New Heights family. I'm so glad to bring you the word again. I hate that you're not here. But uh, if you will, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, that's where we're going to start. We're going to go from Isaiah chapter 8 all the way through chapter 9, verse 7. And uh, while you're looking that up, I want to ask you, have you ever put your hope into something that you think would give you uh, some worth later on? I I'll give you a silly example. When I was a kid, I used to play this game, and it was NCAA football. So I would uh, pick a college, and I would play football as that college. And so I created my own college. And, and in fact, I went in and edited every single player. I named every single player. I changed every single player's face, hairstyle, hair color. I basically changed everything from their socks to almost their fingernails, to be honest. I changed everything about them, and, and I enjoyed playing that. But I thought putting all this time and hours and hours of editing would, you know, pay off later down the line and a year passed and two years passed and you know I, I totally forgot about that game the two new versions of that game came out and 
to be honest, I even remember the moment when I went into my memory card because I needed more memory for my newer games, and I actually deleted that file. So now when you look back, all those hours and all that time, and it didn't amount to anything. Even though I put my hope that I would enjoy this later, it's all for naught. And so today I want to talk about hope, especially hope and confidence in something during a pandemic where everything seems so chaotic and so wild. So we have to start off with this question, what exactly is hope? What is hope? John Piper sees that there's at least three different ways that we use the word hope. We use it as a desire for something good in the future, like a child saying, I hope my dad comes home early so we could have supper with him and we could go play out with him in the yard. I hope my dad comes home early. We also use it as the good thing in the future that we're desiring. Like, I hope Jim will arrive safely. Or I hope Barbara gets to feeling better soon. We also will use it in the reason why our hope might indeed come to pass. So not only are we saying, uh, I hope this will happen, but we think if we put a fact with it, that it, it might actually come to happen. So, uh, for example, we say a good tailwind is our only hope of arriving on time. But see, all three of these uses don't exactly come down to how the Bible uses the word hope. See, biblical hope is not present in any of these ordinary uses. In fact, the distinctive meaning of hope in Scripture is almost the opposite of our ordinary usage. See, we say that we hope because we would like something to happen, but the biblical usage of it is more uh, a confident expectation, a desire for something good in the future. So it's not, I hope that the future is good. It's a confident expectation that it is good in the future. We're not putting our feet on shifting sand. We are putting our feet on the solid rock when we say, I put my hope in this. So the question is that when everything is so chaotic, when everything is just acting so crazy, what exactly should we put our hope in? Because if you look at most people, we find that people put hope in stuff all the time. They put hope in love, meeting the perfect spouse. They put hope in family, as long as my family is taken care of. They put hope in money, so they could say, I, I have money for retirement, or I have money for, for this or for that. For a rainy day, I have my savings account. They put hope in education. In fact, we work our whole life, usually, to make sure that we're educated and qualified. And then, usually when people have children, they spend their whole life trying to make sure that they go to the right schools and get the right test scores and earn the right degrees. People put hope in power and influence. If only this person or president right now. Or if only this political party was in power in the Senate. We even put hope in our own health. But what should we be placing our hope in? When everything seems so chaotic and no, no one knows what's happening to any of these things, where do we place our hope? So we're going to look in the book of Isaiah starting in chapter 8, to see what we need to fully put our hope in. Read with me. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it these common characters, belonging to Mahir Shalal Hashbais. Now, this, this name that he's going to end up naming his son uh, roughly translates to the enemy is coming swiftly, with haste, to take your treasures. Just like a, a predator would go at, swiftly go after its prey. So in other words, the enemy is coming, and they're coming quickly to take everything that you find valuable. 
And in verse 2 it says, and I'll get some reliable witnesses. Let's go to verse 3. And I went to the prophetess, that's his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, call his name, Ahir Shalal Hashbaiz. For before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Now let's just back up some. The kingdom of Israel, so that's the northern kingdom, and Syria decide to join up. And they attack some places, including Judah, and they take some treasure back with them to Damascus, and they take some treasure back to Samaria. And so God is saying the wealth of Damascus, everything that they took, and the spoil of Samaria, everything they took, will be carried away before the king of Assyria. In other words, somebody is going to attack them and take away everything that they had. And the Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has refused the water of Shaloah, that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river. Mighty and many, the king of Assyria in all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks. And it will sweep on into Judah. In other words, even though I am punishing Syria and Israel as the northern kingdom, it will flow over into the southern kingdom of Judah. And it will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, and its outspread rings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear to all, you far country. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. So we've talked a lot about who controls everything. God controls everything. We're seeing that God is able to make things come to pass. Why? Because he controls everything. Take counsel together. In other words, try and figure out a way around this, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me, and with his strong hand upon me, and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that these people call conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him who you shall honor as holy, let him be your fear, and let him be your dread." And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to those houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it and they shall fall and be broken and they shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. In other words, what I'm saying right now, wrap it up because it's going to come to pass. And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwell on Mount Zion. In other words, look at what the Lord has been saying. I'm trusting in what the Lord has been saying. And when they say to you, inquire, of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. In other words, the people who talk to the dead. The psychics. It says, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. In other words, why are you going to ask the dead about what's happening to the people in the living? What would they know? Look to what God has said. And if you don't look to what God has said, it says there is no dawn. There is no light. There's only darkness. And they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their face upward. And they will look on the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. But look at chapter 9. Look at the hope that's about to come. But there will be no gloom for her who has an anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And the people who walked in darkness 
have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness and on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation and you have increased its joy and they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. As they are glad when they divide the spoil. In other words, there will be so much joy it will be like harvest time when all the work is done and they get to reap the benefits. Or when they finish conquering a place and they get to divide all of its treasures. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor. You have broken as on the day of Midian. And if you look at the book of Judges, I believe it's chapter 6 and 7, you'll see the day of Midian in the story of Gideon. And that's the story where God takes a small amount of people and scares off this Midianite army that seemed too numerous to ever take down. Midianites were great oppressors. The Bible says they were like locusts in the land. Every time that there was a, a new animal, they would take it. Every time it seemed that there was a, a new crop come up, they would take it to where Israel had absolutely nothing. But the Lord came through Gideon and conquered the Midianites that day. And so just like God took the yoke of the burden off of them and the staff of the shoulder that rang them back in and the rod of the oppressor of the Midianites that would be to attack, God is going to do it again just like he did on the day of Midian. For every brood of the trampling warrior in battle turmoil and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Check this. This is verse 6. For to us a child is born. This is the hope. For to us a child is born and a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So I want you to see three different truths of hope this morning. The first truth about hope is there is no hope outside of God. No hope. Let me read you some verses. Proverbs 10, 28. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Lamentations 3, 17 through 18. My soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is, so I say my endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. In other words, the physical things have gone away. The things I could have put my hope in. So now I, I, I have no hope. Ezekiel 37, 11. And he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. These are the, these are the bones that Ezekiel will actually preach to and they'll see alive. But look what he says. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We are completely cut off. The first thing we need to know about hope is we should not place our hope in anything else but God. Easy to say, difficult to do. And when we do not snuff out these small areas of misplaced hope, they can become huge, sinful barriers between us and God. How do I know that there is misplaced hope? Just as, as, as I'm standing here, how, how do I know that people have misplaced hope? I want you to listen to these statistics since the beginning of the pandemic. Federal survey shows 
40% of Americans are now grappling with at least one mental health or drug-related problem, 40%. But young adults have been hit harder than any other age group. I want you to listen to this. With 75% struggling with one mental health problem or a drug-related problem. 75% for our young adults. Overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal, have increased 20% compared with the same time period last year. The calls to the spousal abuse hotlines dropped in the first couple of weeks. It's this honeymoon period of us coming together, but listen... It dropped in the first few weeks of the pandemic, but increased 30% in April. And increased by 76% by August. And they have remained elevated into the month of September, and I assume through October and now November. Even more alarming is when the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention recently asked young adults if they had thought about killing themselves in the past 30 days. One in four said they had. According to a new public opinion poll released by American Psychiatric Association, 62% of Americans feel more anxious than they did this time last year. And that's a sizable increase over APA polls of the last three years in which the numbers have ranged between 32% and 39%. Nearly double the people are exponentially more stressed out. We see rise in overdoses, in abuse, in suicides. We see increase in stress and anxiety and mental disorders and problems and drug problems. It all comes back to one thing. Something in their life has been totally rocked by this pandemic. So what are they stressed over? When asked what made them extremely or somewhat anxious, Americans said these were the top issues. Keeping themselves and their family safe, 80% said that. COVID-19, so their health, 75%. Their health, 73%. Gun violence, 73%. And the upcoming presidential election, 72%. We could see that the pandemic has rocked us in many ways and has created a very dark cloud over many individuals and many families. So what does Isaiah have to say about this? Especially what does Isaiah have to say about the things that we see that people have placed much of their hope in? Let's look. uh, Wealth. How many families have been hit hard by uh, being fired and being let go, being laid off? How many have had uh, problems with uh, your retirements or or locked up in your 401k or stocks? um, Stocks haven't been looking too good. Look in chapter 8, verse 4. For before the boyness had a cry, my father and my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Can they trust in their hope? Can they, can they hope in their wealth? Sorry. No. What about military strength? Chapter 8, verse 10. Take counsel together. There it says, call your counsels of war is what the NLT says, or the NASB and the NIV say, try and devise a plan. But guess what? Nothing will come of it. You could bring the best plan, the the biggest military power that you can. It wouldn't stop anything. Well, what about political strength? It talks about in uh, chapter 8, verse 12. Do not call conspiracy all that this people call conspiracy. What this is talking about is this conspiracy that the the government is doing this weird thing. And and so maybe if we replace the, the king and... 
wouldn't do anything. Can't hope in military strength, health, wealth, political strength. What about family? Can I, can I at least hope in my family? We see that Assyria will forcibly resettle many of the Israelites. The Assyrian captivity, family is scattered. And not to mention that health is at stake. These are all military conquests. Health is at stake here. And if you go, oh, well, I don't, this even affected Judah. We see uh, in 2 Chronicles, verses, uh, in chapter 28, verses 5, let me read that for you. Therefore the Lord his God gave him into the land of the king of Syria. So this is in Judah. Syria defeated Judah. And they took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus. Verse 6. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and that's the king of Israel, he killed 120,000 men. And then you see in verse 8, they took capture of 200,000 men, women and children, just relatives took them away from their homes, away from their family. We see Judah, who chapter 8 is not even fully about. It's really about Syria, really about Israel. But it's trying to warn Judah. Judah nearly had half a million people either killed or taken away from their homes and family. And again, this isn't the only place in the Bible where we see people losing nearly everything, either because of their own sin or because God is doing something. We see it in Adam and Eve. We see it in Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah. We see it with the Moses. After he kills the man, he has to run away for 40 years. We see it with Samson. We see it with Job. We see it with King Saul. We even see it with David and his family and all the turmoil that was there. And the list goes on and on and on. And I don't tell you all this to depress you more. I don't tell you this and and these statistics of all these terrible things that are happening around the country to make you sad or to guilt trip you somehow. What I want you to do is I want you to see that when we put our hope in these other things, There's no good that comes out of them. There's nothing positive that happens. Life is controlled by God, and if our mind's attention and heart's affection is placed in anything else, we will find ourselves totally unsatisfied. And that has never been made more clear than now. So what do we do? Psalms 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. David prays this. So small things that he has placed his hope in do not become larger problems and sinful barriers. How do you know that you have these places in your life? I'm going to give you a a couple of different questions, three different questions, actually. And this will kind of give you an idea of things that you might put before God. So you at least need to watch out, if not correct. You need to ask yourself, what do I see is valuable? What do I see is valuable? Because those things can distract from God when things are bad. You need to ask the question, what do I see as security? Because those are the things that you will revert to when things get tough. And you need to ask yourself, what do I see as my essentials? What can I not live without? Because believe it or not, those are the things that you will grab onto tighter and tighter. And you will go and hide yourself in the face of God instead of leaning on Him embracing Him, and trusting Him. 
And if we are honest, these are things that will come between you and your relationship with Christ. Those small things can easily become much, much bigger things. So what do we put our hope in? This is my second point. Hope in God's Word. Hope in God's Word. Psalm 119, 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your Word. Psalm 135. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His Word, I wait hope. Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The main way to set your hope on God is to read his word. Why read the word? Well, it's God breathed. It's a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. It is how a young man can keep his way pure. It's by guarding it according to God's word. It says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We find that in Ephesians 6, 17. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of the spirit, of the, joint, of the joints and of the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the attentions from the heart. In other words, Hebrews 4.12 is trying to show you if you are wanting to get closer to God and you're wanting to set your hope on something that will actually last, read the word of God. But be afraid, it will pierce through you and it will show you things about yourself that you don't like. But it will set you on the right path and it will be a light into your feet. We know this. We know that reading your Bible is important. Yet, we see people really are putting trust in themselves and not God. How do I know this? Let me read some more statistics for you. Between early 2019 and 2020, the percentage of U.S. adults who said that they use the Bible daily, these are daily Bible readers, strong Christians, we would say, dropped from 14% to 9%, according to the State of the Bible 2020 report released in Barna Group in the American Bible Society. By June, the percentage of daily Bible users had dropped to 8.5%. The decrease of five percentage points in a single year was unprecedented. In the annual survey's 10-year history between 2011 and 2019, daily Bible readers had basically held steady at the average of 13.7% of the population. And at the wake of this pandemic, it dropped over 5%. These are people who read the Bible. No longer reading the Bible daily. In June, 13.1 million fewer Americans were Bible engaged than in January. 13.1. Within that overall decrease, the Bible centered group, that is, people who make the decisions based on the Bible, the Bible-centered segment was most impacted, decreasing by 9.7 million. These are mothers and daughters and brothers and sisters. And when, when they come face-to-face -face with the pandemic, they grab tight to the things that they found essential and the things that they thought they needed and hid their face from God. New Heights Baptist Church. Brothers and sisters, we cannot do that. We cannot afford to do that. These numbers are reality because people seem to double down on relying on self and not on God. But let's see what Isaiah has to say about the word. This is in chapter 8, verses 16 through 20. Bind up the testimony and seal the teachings among my disciples. In other words, I told you earlier, 
what God has said, it's about to come true. In other words, the things, anything else that you're trying to grasp at isn't going to be objectively true. The things that God is telling you, bind it up because it's going to happen. And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. He chooses to hope in God. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they not inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. In other words, forget everything else. None of that is wisdom. Go to the teachings and the testimonies. And if they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. This is scary to me. Because if I'm reading many of these statistics correctly, there are a lot of people that do not have a dawn. I do not have a hope. Make sure that you are continuing to get in your Bible. Continuing to fill your spirit with hope. If we are not placing our hope in the word of God, what are you placing your hope in? So what do we need to do? It is necessary that you know the word. If the word of God is so important to life and our walk with Christ, why do we not take time to learn it? We will learn sports scores, we will learn trivia, we will learn songs and handy other little information. But when it comes to the word of God, we put it on the back burner. Let me tell you, the word of God is necessary for growth. We see in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and training for righteousness. And the word of God keeps us close to God. And it keeps everything in perspective. For me, that's the biggest. Not only do I need to be corrected, but I need to have my perspective right. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. John Stott, who is a... Uh, preacher is quoted saying we must allow the word of God to confront us to disturb our security to undermine our complacency and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior and only then will we begin to see the light of hope that God has for us my third thing is we need to hope in God's son Hope in God's Son. Colossians 1.27, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 1 John 3, 2-3, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears... We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 1 Peter 3, or 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Why is the word of God so important? It's because the word of God points us to Jesus Christ, God's Son. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation. Salvation comes through Jesus. And the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what Jesus gave us to be a helper. Which is the Word of God. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, 
not anything made that was made in him was a life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it jesus is the word of god and he is the promise of god and what is what does isaiah have to say about jesus isaiah looks forward to the birth of Jesus. There's gloom for these people. He said, there'll, there'll be no gloom. There'll be rejoicing and there will be joy. Listen, in verse 6, for us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and their peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So let's break this down. The government shall be upon his shoulder. We see just in chapter 9, Jesus moves from gloom to glory, from darkness to light, from oppression to joy. Life does not rely on us, but Jesus, whose shoulders all authority rests. And everything hangs on what kind of ruler Jesus is. And what does it say that he is? He is a wonderful counselor. He's wise. Look at Isaiah 28, 29 for this. And I see within a counselor, there are three very important things that you want in a counselor. Number one, you want someone to direct you. And he directs himself and us. In Ephesians 1, 11, he even directs the counsel of his will. I'll tell you, look at Romans 11, 33 through 36, and Psalm 73, 24. If you're having trouble keeping up with this, I will have all these notes for this sermon on our website, newheightspueblo.org, on Monday. He's a wonderful counselor. He's wise. He directs you. He listens to you. And not only that, he relates to you. Jesus was born fully God, fully man. Lived through all the stress and anxieties that you go through. And died on a sinner's cross for my sin and yours. He can relate. He is a mighty God. He is strong. Jesus is not only mighty, which I believe that we need to live most of our lives believing more that Jesus is mighty, more that he has power, more that the Holy Spirit has power. But not only that, but Jesus is God. Fully God. He's not just some man. He wasn't picked later by God. He was born fully God, fully man. And because of that, he's the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 1, 2-3, radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. Colossians 2, 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So he is wise and he is strong. Not only that, but he is everlasting father, which means he is caring. In Isaiah 53, 10, we see that it's referred to see his offspring that, that would be talking about us. Jesus becomes a type of father to those he brings into the family of God. That doesn't mean that he is God the Father. He's still God the Son. But he's like to us an everlasting father. John 14, 18 through 20, it says, I will not leave you as orphans. You will know that I am in my father. Not only is he wise, strong, and caring, he is a prince of peace. Shalom. Isaiah 53, 5. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Romans 5, 1. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what kind of government would this child bring? A wise government. A strong king, a caring father, and a prince 
of peace. I'm going to say this quote by John Calvin. Whenever, in short, it appears to us that everything is in a ruinous condition, let us recall to our remembrance that Christ is called wonderful because he has inconceivable methods of assisting us and because of his power is far beyond what we are able to conceive. When we need counsel, let us remember that he is the counselor. When we need strength, let us remember he is mighty and strong. When new terrors spring up suddenly, Every instant, and when many deaths threaten us from various quarters, let us rely on the eternity of which he is with good reason called the Father. And by the same comfort, let us learn to soothe all temporal distress. And when we are inwardly tossed by various tempests, and when Satan attempts to disturb our consciousness, let us remember that Christ is the Prince of Peace. That it is easy for him to quickly allay all our uneasy feelings. And this will these titles confirm us more and more in the faith of Christ and fortify us against Satan and against hell itself. There are so many things that we could place our hope in. Relationships, jobs, money, family, health, wealth, and prosperity. But none will bring satisfaction. None will bring you back to the purpose that you were born for, and none of them will bring you back to the joy, love, and peace of the Lord. Only one thing can do that. That's Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Where must we put our hope? We must not put our hope in anything except God. We must hope in his word and hope in his son. We cannot be perfect every day. In fact, we can't even be perfect probably this very second. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot earn our way into anything. All we will find is darkness and gloom. Only Jesus can change our hearts, our minds, and our very souls. Because see, Jesus, in the beginning, he created everything. And he saw once humans sinned, he knew that he had to come as a sacrifice. And he was born. He was born of a virgin, fully God, fully man. He lived the perfect life. He spoke about the kingdom of God. And he died on a sinner's cross for my sins and for your sins. So that we wouldn't be held accountable for them anymore. And on the third day, he arose in victory over death and restored our relationship with God. Where all you have to do today is believe in him. Put your hope in him. So today, let us go out into the world and ask Jesus earnestly to change us, to be more like him, and ask Jesus, Jesus, will you start in my heart to start putting more and more hope in you every single day? Pray with me. God, you are our only hope. There is no other hope but you. There is no other hope but Jesus Christ. This pandemic, I believe, has shown us that many things that we thought were our hope are nothing. Many things that we are frightened by, stressed by, that God, you say, it's because of you. I shouldn't have put my hope in them in the first place. God, through the difficulty and through the strife, will you be our wonderful counselor who not only listens, not only directs, but you relate to us. Will you be our mighty God and answer our prayers? Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Be our Prince of Peace and our everlasting Father so that when we lose hope in things of this world, that we won't flutter, 
that we won't chase other things to fill the void, but that we will lean on you in everything in our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.